everything they're telling me. So yeah, I think it is important. And one of the reasons I bring it up is that many of these people, they want to throw the book at Snowden. And I have mixed feelings what should happen, because I, I think you can't release secrets all the time. I mean, that would lead to chaos. But at the same time, I think he also wanted to reveal something he thought was unconstitutional. But for all the people that want to throw the book and the letter of the law at Snowden, I like the contrast. They don't want to do a thing. They're not a peep out of them for, for Clapper. So you, you're not really being consistent if you want to throw the book at Snowden, but you don't want to do a thing to Clapper. They both broke the law, technically, and then you have to decide what justice is. But yeah, I think Clapper should be tried for perjury. So you say you're asked this all the time, um, but we want to get it in here too. Uh, would you classify Edward Snowden as, on the one hand, a hero or a traitor? And to phrase that slightly differently, maybe, um, if there were another Edward Snowden out there, uh, would you encourage him to speak up? You know, I think the ultimate decision of hero or villain history is going to sort out. And I think there are pros and cons to a lot of it. And I know people have a strong feeling about it. I think that his intentions were good, but here's the problem. Let's say we have 400, 500 people here, and let's say you all are, you know, we're talking to you and you're the new recruits for the CIA or for the intelligence for our army. Should I tell all 500 of you, just decide when you think it's unconstitutional and just reveal secrets anytime? You could see how it could lead to chaos. But at the same time, I'm very upset about what our intelligence community is doing. We might not have ever known about it had Snowden not leaked it. Some say Snowden should have tried to become a whistleblower. I don't know if he did try or what the process is, but I think on the one hand you have chaos. You know, Bradley Manning released 24 million pages. There's a chance that people could die from that. There's a chance that intelligence could get out that it could endanger our agents. And I'm not against spying. I mean, we will have people gathering intelligence around the world, and I don't think that we can allow uh, willy-nilly indiscriminate uh, release of documents. But at the same time, I'm sympathetic to what was released because I think it's a real problem. So I have mixed feelings, is the bottom line. Um, so you posed a very interesting question during your address. Um, you asked uh, about potential uh, CIA spying on Senate uh, computers. Um, to quote you, if the CIA is spying on Congress, who exactly can or will stop them? Um, so what would be your answer to this question? Well, see, here's the interesting thing, and this is uh, worth everybody reading about. The way I understand it, and this is what Senator Feinstein said in her speech, they came across something. They were given access to the CIA computers by the CIA. The search engine was created by the CIA. They say, and this, I'm just going from what they're telling me, they say they found a report called the Panetta Review, which looked into some previous activities of the CIA, interrogation and detention, and they got it through the search engine. If that's true, the CIA then may have said, oh, whoops, <laughs> we didn't want you to read that. But think about that. If it was a mistake by the CIA, you can say, well, it was a mistake, but why should the CIA be allowed to withhold an internal review from the people overseeing the CIA? So that to me is the arrogance that they think they're in charge and it's too important to let members of Congress know about. Well, if your members of Congress don't know about it, the people you have some interaction with and can get rid of or elect, then who is in charge? You can't have people who are not elected in charge of your government. And that is really, I think, the very definition of tyranny. So this to me is a very important thing. And, and I also want to make the point that I'm not saying that any of these people are necessarily evil or that they have bad motives. I think a lot of them have good intentions. And maybe they're not even abusing their power at all. The danger, though, is allowing that much power to go unchecked and not have review by Congress. Um, so we obviously don't have all the information yet. Um, it's a recent scandal. But if these allegations of the CIA hacking into uh, Senate computers do prove to be true, then who do you think should be held responsible? Uh, would it be just CIA Director John Brennan or perhaps um, some official higher up in the federal government? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Brennan was approved about a year or two ago. That's when I was I actually did the filibuster was to his nomination. And um, so whether or not it's Brennan or someone who precedes him, but Brennan oversees it now and he's defending the program and saying it didn't happen. But here's the real direct question. There's some media here y'all need to ask is ask Brennan, what about the Panetta Review? Why should Congress not be allowed to read the Panetta Review 
of the CIA interrogation program. I mean, if I'm not allowed to look at it, and this is something you also need to realize, many of this, much of this that goes on in the Intelligence Committee, I'm not allowed to read, okay? The Intelligence Committee is allowed to read things I'm not allowed to read, and then the head of the Intelligence Committee is allowed to read some things that the rest of the Intelligence Committee isn't. Some of the revelations that have come forward have come forward, and the day before they came forward, the CIA calls up Senator Feinstein and Chapel and says, oh, by the way, we've been collecting email for the last 10 years. It's going to be revealed tomorrow. You know, so we're really not in the loop on this stuff, and we're not overseeing it. They're doing what they want, and then when they get caught, they, they inform us, but that's not oversight, and that's not representative government. This is incredibly important, not just because of abuse that may be occurring, but because of abuse that could happen if someone took the reins of power and really wanted to use this for um, malevolent purposes. All right, so we have time for just one more question for this interview. Um, this is on sort of a different topic. Um, there has been pretty extensive media coverage of your recent visits to places that don't usually vote Republican, like students at Howard University. You mean like and, Berkeley? And, and, <laughs> and at UC Berkeley. <laughs> um, there has been quite a lot of speculation that these efforts constitute an attempt on your part uh, to broaden your personal appeal in anticipation of a 2016 presidential run. Um, how do you reply to these claims? Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Part of it might be that. Part of it might be that the Republican Party is, I, I've said they have to either evolve, adapt, or die. You know, it's a pretty harsh thing. I think I was telling somebody the other day, remember Domino's finally admitted they had bad crust? <laughs> think Republican Party admitted, okay? Bad crust, we need a we need a different kind of party. But I think some of One of the things that really upset me in the last couple of years was that we passed legislation, really done by Republicans and Democrats, frankly, that allows an American citizen to be indefinitely detained without a trial, and I had a conversation with another senator, and I said, does this mean an American citizen could be accused of a crime and sent to Guantanamo Bay with no trial, no lawyer? He said, yeah, they're dangerous. I said, well, kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide whether you're dangerous or not? The reason why I think this is important is many sort of libertarians, libertarian-leaning Republicans, people who believe in individual rights, this really bothers us. But I think it's a bigger audience than that, because Think about it. If you're African American, Japanese American, Jewish American, Hispanic, have there ever been times when the government didn't treat you fairly? Have there ever been times when you said, you know what, the war on drugs has had a racial outcome. Three out of four people in prison are brown or black. So something's gone wrong. Maybe a candidate who would stand up and say, everybody deserves their day in court. The law should not have a racial outcome. Maybe then people would say, you know what, I always hated those Republicans and their, their crust sucks, but maybe there's some new Republicans, maybe there'll be a new GOP. We'll see. Thank you. So we also have some questions from the audience. Oh, God. I uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, passed out no cards before, and you guys have submitted some questions, so I was going to read a few of them uh, to the senator. Uh, this actually relates to your last point. Uh, do you think the issues of privacy and civil liberties could be used to bridge the partisan divide in Congress? You know, yes, and I think there's also there's a, there's a right-left nexus on this. One of the persons I work most closely with in Washington on NSA, spying abuse, more oversight needed is Ron Wyden. Now, he and I don't agree on some economic liberty issues. You know, he's not so much for lower taxes or less regulations. But on this, we're almost in 100% agreement on some of these intelligence issues. I think it's a way you could actually get things done. That compromise isn't always splitting the difference, 
But compromise means meaning that your party label isn't as important as the issue is. So to me, I, I honestly would tell you whether this was a Republican or a Democrat president, I would give exactly the same speech. And I think Ron Wyden would too. I think he's an, an honest progressive. In fact, I ribbed some of the others by saying, whatever happened to the good liberals around here, all right? You know, because you can be, a, I think, even someone who isn't a progressive, be progressives who are honestly good or I think very good on civil liberties. In fact, the president was. When he was a senator, President Obama was much better on civil liberties than he is now. Uh, next question from the audience. <laughs> um, if elected president, how would you respond to the recent increase of executive power? I think one of the biggest problems in the last 100 years, not Republican, not Democrat, but last 100 years has been the increase in power of the executive. We have thousands of orders written by the executive. Um, Montesquieu wrote and said, you know, he was big on the separation of powers and the checks and balances. He said when the executive begins to legislate, that becomes a form of tyranny. The check and balance is that the executive, the president's not allowed to legislate, only the legislature can. But it's a messy process and you gotta, you, everybody's gotta just come to grips with that. It's a messy process and it's not easy. But that's why you have to convince people on the other side of the aisle to vote for your stuff. And it is also why we have so much contention over the health care plan. Not one Republican voted for it. Had there been some Republicans voting for it, or had the Democrats come a little bit to our side to have a discussion, I don't think we'd be having this big war in our country right now. So really, I think the way I look at issues is we don't have to agree on everything. We are probably a mixture of people from parties and, and all different walks of life here. And let's say we take 10 issues. We're not going to agree all on all 10. You know, we might agree on three out of 10. Why don't we work on the three out of 10 issues we agree on rather than spend our whole time fighting around the seven out of 10? Next question from the audience. Uh, you have voiced support for a flat tax system. Uh, are you concerned about the potential increase in inequality resulting from such a system? One of the interesting things is some of the wealthy pay no taxes. Some of the corporations, wealthy corporations, pay no taxes under the current system. Another interesting fact, over the last five years, income equality has gotten worse, even though we raise tax rates. So it is something you have to kind of think through as far as how you want to make it better. I'm of the opinion that the way you stimulate the economy and the way you create jobs is by leaving more money in the economy. And you may say that sounds incredibly simplistic, but it's true. The private economy creates jobs. We have to have a certain amount of government, but we should minimize the size of government because it's not very good at stuff. Why is, I'll often, I'll often say, I'll often say it's not that government is inherently stupid, although it's a debatable point, is that they don't get the same signals. So for example, we need to have a national defense and it can't be done privately. Same with the judiciary and the legislative branch and roads and education and things like this where the government will be involved. And so I think you can argue that that should occur, but we should keep it and not expand it to all walks of life. Do they, does the government need to sell pizza? You know, does the government need to deliver the mail? That's really a problem. They probably shouldn't be delivering the mail. They're not very good at that either, but... Um, <laughs> We should minimize what government does and try to maximize the private sector. And that's, I think, where jobs are created. But to me, though, it's getting beyond the hurdle. I can go to a poor community in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and I'll say, bring me the 10 richest people in your town because I would like to reduce their taxes. And you may be horrified and say, oh, he cares only about rich people. No, we all work for rich people. So I want the people who own the business, the guy who owns the business in Middlesboro, Kentucky, who employs 100 people, is probably the richest guy in town. How am I going to get him to hire, or, or her, to hire 110 people? Reduce their taxes. So we got to get over this class warfare that rich people are bad people. The top 1% pay 40% of the income tax. There are some exceptions to the rule, and we should fix the exceptions, meaning that if there's some in the top 1% that aren't paying taxes, they should. In some ways, a flat tax accumulates more of those people, and you lose less of those people by having less deductions and having a flatter, simpler code. But I'm also for reducing everyone's taxes, not just the middle class, everyone's taxes. Uh, 
Uh, this is going to be your.